Welcome everybody to this week's seminar. Today we have a pleasure to have Oskar Smovic from Center for Theoretical Physics. He is a student uh, of Adam Savitsky, so Oskar specializes in mathematical aspects of quantum information and quantum computing, both like group theoretical, algebraic, and other aspects also. But today he will be telling us something that was a part uh, subject of his master thesis, I believe, in uh, the physics. So how to construct locally maximal entangled states uh, that have some prescribed symmetries. So it's great to have you, Oscar. The screen is yours. Thanks, Michal. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and be able to present uh, the results of, my, of our work. So this work is a joint work with Adam uh, and Tomasz Maciążek, and it is based on the paper which is already published on, um, by, by a quantum journal. So if you are interested, then I encourage you to check the details in the paper. Just one thing before I start. So I have like 45 plus questions or, or with questions or... Well, Oscar, you know how it is. It's flexible. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. But yeah, okay. So you can aim to be brief, then you'll have more time. Okay, so we'll see. So <clears throat> the outline of my talk is the following. So first I will give an introduction where and where I will explain the basic concepts I, I'm using. And I will motivate the whole thing, namely why we care about such uh, states which are um, highly entangled and have large local symmetries. Then I will move to the main mathematical result and I will very briefly tell you what is the idea of the proof because the proof itself is very lengthy and technical, but the idea is simple. Then we will move to some um, corollaries and examples of, of usage of this theorem and other things we proved. And I will finish with the forthcoming research and the summary of the whole talk. So the first two slides are kind of popular. It's a popular introduction. So, um, so let's define what the symmetry is in general. So the symmetry is some mapping of some object into itself, which preserves its structure. So we have three things we need to, to specify in order to say we have a symmetry. And also, so symmetry is, is a kind of invariance because the structure of the object is preserved. And we all already know a lot of examples of symmetries which occur in mathematics in various branches of mathematics, such as uh, geometry, uh, as we know from the kindergarten, um, as in abstract algebra uh, and other <clears throat> many other parts. Also, we know examples of symmetries used in physics, like, for example, in the in nether theorems. So we know that, um, so these are kind of a continuous symmetries. So we all know uh, their importance and what can we how can we use them, for example, to find some kinds of currents and things like that. Also, we all know an example of symmetry, which is in quantum mechanics, which, um, which leads to the dis distinction of particles into bosons and fermions, right? So we already know a lot of examples. Um, so as I said, so here is uh, um, the second uh, slide, which is, which is popular, um, with three organisms. And um, I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't know what are the English names, because I have the, the not Latin, but um, this is an example of, of symmetries in geometry, as we, as we know. Um, so, when speaking of symmetries, we usually try to encapsulate them in some kind of a group. So here I wrote down uh, examples of groups we can use to describe the symmetry. But of course, just specifying these groups does not mean anything because 
unless I will specify how these groups act on our space and also what is the preserved, what are the preserved, what is the preserved mathematical structure of objects. Um, for example, if, if the orientation is preserved or not, then these groups may change, of course. So in our setting, we won't be dealing with animals. We will be dealing and and, ge and geometrical symmetries. We will be dealing with um, quantum states, which belong to some Hilbert space. So these are our objects and our operations of interest are some quantum operation. And, and at this moment, let's say there are some, this is some subset of, of, of SU. And the mappings are some nice homomorphisms from some group to this group of quantum operations. Uh, because, <clears throat> so we will be dealing with, in fact, we are interested in uh, the linear representations of groups, right? If I will give me a homomorphism such this, then of course it will give me a, a representation. And finally, the notion of invariance is pretty, Obvious, so I will say that the state is invariant, or um, so has or has H symmetry if given this um, this this representation pi, um, it it does not change for any choice of operation encoded in this uh, group element H. It does not change, or perhaps it is pro it remains it's proportional to itself because in practice we don't don't really um, we are not interested in uh, in the scaling because we are interested in quantum states which are which have have this additional freedom of of uh, of scaling and uh, global phase so let me move now to the motivation where we really care about this so multipartite entangled states are used in various branches of, uh, of physics are, and are in, in, very important. For example, in quantum in communication, in quantum metrology, in condensed matter, and also in quantum computing. And one of the ways to deal with entanglement in multipartite systems is the operational approach. So we reduce this problem to the problem of convertibility under certain quantum operations. Because we know, we know um, there are many classes, of, there are some classes of operations we do not increase entanglement and hence they can be used to, <clears throat> for the classification of entanglement. Um, our space of interest will be the n-qubit Hilbert space, we all know. And an example of such, such interesting operations are stochastic local operations with classical communication, which act on our Hilbert space naturally um, <clears throat> via this formula. So this uh, operational approach can be used, for example, in such a way that we can say that two states are equally entangled in some sense that if, you know, if in zero probability, they can be converted one to another using these operations from G. So this is one class, stochastic local operations, we probably all know. And also another is given by local unitary group, okay? And they, they are called, let's say, local, uh, it's, it's local unitary operations, right? So they, they are, this is just a local base change, change of basis. So this is, this are kind of, uh, these are kind of two extremes, because of course this G group is much, much larger than K. This of number of stochastic local operations is much, much larger than, than just a local unitary group. But we can also we also have some things in between, uh, which are interesting. For example, we have <clears throat> so this is a relationship between them. We have um, locally, uh, we have a LOCC, so we found stochastic part, and we have set a set of local separable transformation. And application will be to this SEP. <clears throat> so SEP is not so, it's smaller than SLOCC, but larger than uh, LU. So it's nice because uh, if you use SEP to classify entanglement, then these uh, classes of uh, equivalence will be not, uh, not as big as in case of 
um, will have uh, not as big, uh, not not so many as in case of. E. I mean, they will be in between SLCC and uh, LU, which is which is fine. Uh, so <clears throat> this is the definition of offset. So these are just uh, all the maps which are given by class operators, which can be written in the product follow. Um, um, so Oscar, like yes, because uh, when you defined uh, let's say SLOCC or local internal transformations, you were acting on pure states. So the set you defined here doesn't like can leave the set of uh, pure states, right? So um, yeah, it's not clear for me in what sense, like given this definition, uh, the set like SLOCC is more general than SAP. Could you repeat? So in what sense? Yeah, it's not clear in what sense this, I mean, okay. There is some part of the story that, yeah. Like in what sense SAP is uh, less general than SLOCC, the way you defined it, because you defined it via just how this collection of transformations, how they act on pure states. Right, and that and they actually preserve pure states, but here you have this separable transformations and can they can uh, like leave the set of pure states, so they seem to be bigger than SLOCC, right? Yes, so I guess we should uh, only think of of pure states here. Okay, fair enough. So like you sort of. Given a state like row one, you are looking on the cross operators that will have the property that, well, they will map like essentially all those states that appear there in the in the sum, they will be proportional to one another, right? Because yes, I think I think I think so. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so of course among these. Um, among these operations, there are some which do not change a given state or, cha or change it up to some, some uh, just, just rescale it. So this, this <clears throat> leads us to the stabilizer, which is a subgroup of, of G. And um, there is a, some, uh, this, there's a condition which tells us when two states, when two pure states can be connected via set. This is a condition from a paper of Wu and Olaf. And an interesting, an interesting part in this condition is that involves, so it tells us that it is possible whenever there exists some probabilities which add up to one, of course, and some elements from the stabilizer. So it's important because uh, we, we kind of would like to think that if the stabilizer is big of this psi, then we will we somehow have a much greater freedom of choosing these guys in order to satisfy this, this, uh, this condition. So there will be a greater freedom of the conversion under set. So, <clears throat> so we can say that the two properties of quantum states useful for general quantum information is the first that state should be highly entangled and the state should be highly symmetric because the larger the stabilizer, uh, G psi, the greater will be the freedom of possible conversion between psi and psi one and psi two, some, some uh, state. Sorry, Oscar, I missed this point. Why the larger the stabilizer, the greater the freedom of conversion? I yes, because this uh, this condition for two 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 guys to be connected via set involves a sufficient condition for set convert. Okay, you see my courses. So that's nice. So the sufficient condition is this, this thing. So there need to exist some probabilities and some, S, some elements SK from the stabilizer, right? So if the stabilizer is big, then probably I will have much more ways to satisfy this, uh, this equation. Possible. So okay. possibly this equation. Yes. Okay, so that's, thank you. So we focus on the particular kind of highly entangled states, which are called LME. So these are, this, this is from locally maximally entangled. And the definition is that 
if we take any one qubit reduce density matrix matrix any and uh, then it's maximally mixed so it's just proportional to identity so this is the definition of a limit if you have some n qubits if you take any uh, any reduced density matrix of, of, of any of these qubits, it, it will be maximally mixed. Then it's a limit. And also, it's in this LME states um, kind of uh, play a role in the in the SLOCC entanglement classes. I will specify it later. But for now, uh, let's say we are interested in LME also because we know that they form an open and then subset in the space of all uh, quantum states. I mean, the, the SLOCC classes, which go through LME, if L, whenever LME exists, because sometimes LME do not exist in some, so some local dimensions, they do not exist. So, but if they exist, then the SLOCC classes going through LME are open and dense uh, in Zariski. Uh, yeah, um, so, for example, uh, LME states of two qubits are known to have large symmetry groups. For example, uh, the GHZ and W states, and also um, class states, all have stabilizer of dimension greater than one. This is this is known. And but. But a generic quantum state of more than four qubits or uh, more than three qubits has a trivial stabilizer. So, you see, having a large stabilizer is not something very, not something common at all. So, it is a non trivial and fundamentally important task, it seems to identify quantum states that have non-trivial and possibly large stabilizers. Another construction gives states with continuous symmetries. So this is it's, it's in, in contrast with, for example, stabilizer states, which have discrete, uh, discrete, stabil, uh, discrete uh, symmetries. So for example, uh, like here, the streptococcus has a continuous symmetry. Uh, I mean, in the geometrical sense. Where is uh, uh, the starfish or butterfly have discrete symmetry, right? So that's of course that's. Uh... So, but uh, just a comment, Oscar. So actually, stabilizer yes. states they may, at least in the sense that you defined the symmetries of quantum state, uh, they can have some continuous symmetries. It's just uh, like stabilizer states. Uh, are viewed from the perspective of this, uh, of the like Pauli group, right? And you look within the Pauli group on like what operator stabilize a given state, right? So yes. it's a bit uh, like, for example, all zero state is a stabilizer state, right? It's stabilized by Z, while like yeah. or by by uh, by Pauli monomials like. From, from Z operators, but you have a big kind of maybe big stabilizer group, or like continuous. Yes, perhaps you, you can have, but I am just saying that you do not know. Sure. I sure. mean, you know that they have discrete for sure, right? Yeah. But but not we cannot tell much about the continuous symmetries of, of them. Of yes? course. Yeah. That, that's I want what I wanted to say. Uh, so so now I will define the symmetry. What will be this, this symmetry we are looking for? So, um, so we have a multipartite uh, system, and we will say that it has a diagonal H symmetry. So H is any group at the moment. If there exists some non-trivial representations of this group, they can be they can be any, but non-trivial. So I need to so they go from H. To SU decay. So I want this, uh, you know, the image, I want these operations to be um, uh, just sitting inside K, in fact, right? The, the local unitary um, group. We have that, uh, I mean, the state is invariant for every H. I mean, here I should write probably proportional to in the spirit of the like quantum states, right? 
Um, and it's also easy to see uh, that if all these uh, uh, reps I'm using are irreducible, then this state psi is automatically locally maximally entangled. So it is easy. So I wrote it like here, this proof, and it's, I think, uh, the only proof I wrote uh, that you have uh, the equivariance of the under local unitary operations, you have equivariance of, uh, of reduced density matrices. So rho k is the reduced density matrix of k qubit. So you can write it this way. So the reduced density matrix of the transformed uh, state is the same as the, just this uh, local k transformation of the reduced density matrix. And if psi has a diagonal H symmetry from its very definition, for all, for all group elements uh, and all case, we have that uh, this pi k h bar rho k pi k h is the same as rho k, which means that this, this rho k is an intertwiner. So it's h equivariant map with respect to this. So we you now can use true lemma, which is like very basic lemma from representation theory to infer that to deduce that rho k is proportional to identity, which means it's a limit, it's maximally mixed. That's it. So, um, so that's that's nice. And maybe as, as I said, um, but as I said, so we would like to have these LMEs, but but as I said, um, not for there are some rules for which local dimensions such LME states exist. So for which d1, d2, uh, dn, what are the conditions for those? So this, this is solved in uh, this, uh, the paper of Ryan at all from 2018, which has LME in its title. So you can, you can, you can find it. And, but the particular case we will know for sure that such states exist is when all local dimensions are the same. So we will be focusing on a case where uh, we, we have just um, n q dits with the same d. And h is some um, SUM. Um, so just to give you some example of diagonal edge symmetry, let's take the W state. Obviously, it has a one-dimensional stabilizer abelian of this form. Yes, because if you multiply by, by such elements, then they E to I alpha will you can take out E to I alpha as a global phase. Uh, so it, it is stabilized by all such elements because the state remains proportional. So it will have diagonal U1 symmetry given by this equation I wrote. Um, I mean, all k's are the same. It's just, just given by this, this formula. And the obvious corollary from this is that if the tensor product of U apps contains a copy of the trivial representation, then the corresponding representation space contains a limit state with diagonal H symmetry, right? Because exactly, exactly the trivial copy will be all these states which are invariant under this diagonal, this action. So this will be states with diagonal H symmetry, hence a limit states. So that's, I guess that's totally clear. And now I need to um, provide some tools to handle, to deal with the presentation theory of SUNM. Because as, uh, I, I, this is crucial, because now you see that we need to know if some, if the trivial representation will appear somewhere in the tensor product of some representations. So we need to have some tools for that. So, so sorry, Oscar, just yes? like, you are doing a great job. I, I'm understanding everything just maybe for students that are in the audience. So just can you just give, I know it's like one line of reasoning why trivial representation, existence of trivial representation uh, sort of tells you that those LME states exist. Uh, yes, so. With this uh, symmetry, yeah. Yeah, so, so, uh, so as you see from the definition, so the trivial representation is the one uh, where uh, all elements from G Act on a state from the trivial, uh, trivially. So the states. Oh, age. Oh, and, yes. Uh, of age. Yeah. So we will get exactly this line true. 
yeah. where I, well, in the definition of diagonal symmetry, right? If provided that this psi is from this this trivial part, right? Mm -hmm. Hence, this psi will have diagonal symmetry, right? Um, okay, so I have I see like uh, yeah I, I I follow this fully, but in principle you could allow for one ah but you have maybe semi simple groups uh, in places yes, so I'm... you cannot have diagonal uh, you cannot have uh, like one dimensional representation because uh, so... if you had then uh, it would be also giving rise to enemy state right. Okay, so yeah, we'll be focusing on uh, on let's say compact semi simple groups or something. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, so um, it just it will be really like we won't go into the details, uh, but uh, <clears throat> so. There are some some objects which are called Young diagrams, uh, <clears throat> which are used to to handle representation theory of of uh, permutation groups, and also uh, from Shru via Shruva duality representation or theory of general linear groups. And in case of SUN, they are particularly nice because they can. There is, a, uh, let's say, um, each representation can be represented this, uh, via some young diagram. Uh, and if you, if you, if you, if you, in fact, if you, if you uh, allow only young diagrams with zero at the end, then it will be one to one, which is nice for SUN and not, not it's not true for GL, GL. But anyway, so young diagram is some, some um, let consists of boxes and they are adjusted to left and to top always as this. And they correspond to a partition of some number. So this number is number of boxes. Right. So, for example, here you have Young diagram for five, three, two. The point is that these numbers need to be non non increasing, such that so that the the rows uh, number of boxes in each row is non increasing like this. And the Young tableau is a Young diagram with some filling. So we can put their numbers or uh, of, of or things like that. I, I pick numbers, but to co confuse you, I will use later the letters. So. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, another operation which is useful is the transpose, which is uh, just you need to uh, reflect this uh, diagram along the diagonal and you get a transpose. All right. So, okay, this one is a little bit more technical, but I just, maybe don't read it. I will just tell you something and we will move on. Um, so, the, the crucial fact is that each irreducible representation of SUM corresponds to exactly one Young diagram with at most n minus one rows. So for SU2, it will be one row, uh, et cetera. But if you, get, if you uh, skip this at most n minus one, then you will get, get, get some redundancy. But if you have at most n minus one, then it will be one to one correspondence, which is nice for. And as I, as I said, a diagram is identified with the non-increasing partition of number M, which is the dimension of SU. And uh, <clears throat> you, you can, you know, uh, in what space this representation, each reducible representation sit, it's, it sits in the, um, in the alternating, in the uh, alternating uh, anti-Semitic product of the natural representation, yeah. So natural representation is just uh, SUM acts on m-dimensional complex vector space by matrix multiplication. This is called natural representation. So this is because that's very natural, right? Uh, so it, uh, so keep in mind this representation because it will be used later. And you know it always sits in this in this in this um, alternating tensor power. And this mu comes from the uh, the um, transpose of lambda. Which is this uh, this guy which encodes this um, this initial era. 
Now, um, so here is an example of if you have row, you have n uh, with n once, you just get alternating representation. And if you get, if you have, sorry, if you have row with n once, you get sym symmetric representation. And if you get, if you have column with n once, you get the alternating representation. Anyway, you can always write the highest weight vector um, of E lambda easily from, from, from lambda itself. You just need to transform like this, uh, this way. Uh, another thing, another crucial operation is multiplication. So um, if you multiply two irreducible representations, um, you they in case of SUN, because it's, of course you can decompose into ELEPS. So in general, such a representation is not irreducible, but you can decompose it into its con constituents. And there will be some coefficients. And this it just means that this coefficient just means how many times this uh, this ELEP um, is appears in the decomposition. Okay, so this is the meaning of the C. And there is there are some combinatorial procedure. There is some combinatorial procedure um, involving Young diagrams, which enables you to in fact um, do this decomposition. But I won't tell you how to do it. Uh, it's just some combinatorial thing. And the, so the first thing which is kind of easy is the necessary condition for, um, for the appearance of the trivial representation. Um, so, okay, so, ours, so if E lambda is the trivial representation of SUM, I mean, it's if and only if the lambda is a rectangular diagram with M rows. Yes. And the second fact is that if you take the n tensor power of the natural representation, then it will contain all representations with Young diagrams of length n. And if you know how to multiply uh, Young diagrams, then it's totally obvious. Mm. And from this, you can write the necessary condition. The necessary condition is that if the nth tensor, so if you pick one irreducible representation and you take its tensor powers and you ask how many times you need to, to power it to uh, get a copy of the trivial representation in its decomposition into irreducible. So if it contains a copy, then it means that uh, the length of partition, so uh, lambda times n is an integer multiple of m, which is the dimension of the, uh, I mean, uh, not the dimension of the group, but the dimension of the space on which SUM acts naturally, right? Um, and the main result is that if E lambda is an E of SUN, then you need to take it n times. Then, then if you take n times, it will contain a copy of the trivial ELEP. So you see this, uh, if you lambda n needs to be an integer multiple of m, the easiest way to, to do it is just put m, e, m equal big N. But this part tells you that actually this necessary condition, I mean, the, uh, if you take m equal n, then it's already, um, it works. So it's the main theorem. And so here is an example for SUT, so for SU3, how to uh, show, um, okay, I mean, you cannot understand this if you do not know how to multiply these young diagrams, um, but uh, we just give some procedure uh, how to, how to, because um, the idea is that you need take the boxes from, from the right-hand side or from the smaller diagram, put some numbers there, uh, ones in the first row or A's in the first row, B's in the second row, et cetera, and take boxes one by one, add it to the first diagram, following some rules, which I won't specify. And you need to look what kind of shapes you get out of it. If you get, if you will get a rectangle with M rows, then you are, we are done. So we are just 
giving a, a recipe how to do it. Um, but let me skip it and move to the applications because we don't have uh, much time. So the first application is uh, to obtain QDID states with complete diagonal LU symmetry. So what is the complete diagonal LU symmetry? So we take uh, n QDIDs. We take just the natural representation of SUD on CD. So SUD acts on CD by matrix multiplication, yes. And the state which will be symmetric with respect to this action, we will call uh, complete, uh, we'll say that it has complete diagonal LU symmetry because it has diagonal, this group acts on the whole CD, right, SUD. <coughs> uh, so of course it will be symmetric with respect to this action if and only if this state will be annihilated by all generators of the algebra of SUD. So you can write it then down, uh, look at diagonal representation of these generators which correspond to this diagonal action and you will get some conditions for, for this, which is, I mean, that's fairly obvious. The one improvement we have is that we show that in, in fact it suffices to check just, just um, some of them some of the relations, but it's, it's, it's very easy. So we were able to, uh, to check the multiplicity. So this multiplicity is the multiplicity of um, the trivial EF of SUD in CD power N for some small numbers. So it's exactly the dimension of all invariant space, the H, uh, this completely diagonal uh, uh, states which have complete diagonal value symmetry, yes? Because this is just exactly the multiplicity of the trivial representation. So it would be just the dimension of this invariant space. So, uh, so yeah. So we were able to, so it is, well, it is known because it has been done uh, using uh, another methods. What are these numbers uh, analytically? And we also were able to recreate this, this result uh, using a little bit different uh, version of which I thought which the little would rule. Mm. And also we gave some examples uh, <clears throat> of such, so for example, here is, here is such a state. If n equals kd, which is the if and only if condition, we can just take such a state. So we are after taking the, uh, the a with dash is just the taking uh, anti-symmetrization, okay? So we are just anti-symmetrizing uh, the excludeds, but uh, by parts of n. So first d, then Sec then second part with D and then third part with the next D number of QDIT, et cetera, right? And doing so because we can is equal KD, we can write it this way. And it's, it's just an example. We also gave uh, a general algorithm, which is not efficient because it's crazy, obviously exponential with number of particles for uh, finding such uh, invariant space, uh, states for general, semi-simple compact Lie group. <clears throat> so, so that's not, I mean, it's some algorithm, it's, it's not optimal, but at least we had something we, and we were able to test some things. So we, for example, test this algorithm for SOD and some numbers were calculated using this uh, equations. Some, some numbers were calculated using, um, so, uh, some, yeah, the bold ones were also calculated, um, but on a supercomputer. So you need, so you see that it's very hard to calculate using these equations because we needed supercomputer to calculate these bold ones. And, and this, there are some zeros with italics. And these zeros with italics come from some small lemma we proved that tells that there need to be zeros here. Uh, so, so this is this lemma. It just tells that under some conditions, uh, uh, if there are no LME states with diagonal SU2 symmetry given by the ID, we, uh, ID is the uh, derived representation of, uh, of the symmetric representation of SU2, then there are no LME states with diagonal G symmetry. So this is just some small lemma. Uh, let me move to, uh, because I wanted to show another uh, application. So we can, um, 
use it to a system of traps with bosons. So if you take um, three traps with distinguishable traps with bosons, two bosons uh, on each trap. And yet we assume that the, each boson can occupy one of, out of three modes. So this uh, Hilbert space is effectively, uh, let's look, uh, they, they are three, let's say, Q dates with D equals six, six effectively. And the symmetries we are looking for in this system are local diagonal mode, special unitary operations. So they are given by U, where U can be given a, a written using a mode creation annihilation operators. So it's alpha and beta are mode creation annihilation operators uh, uh, of a given mode, yes? So effectively, this, uh, this, this coefficients of a beta are represented on, on a given I've trapped uh, so some six by six unitary in the basis of in the mode basis. And this corresponds to uh, pi being a rep of SU3 with a uh, Lang diagram given by two. Um, and in order to find such, such, uh, such states, we, we solved uh, just these equations for the, uh, for the generators and um, for, for, uh, satisfied by, by the state when we are acting uh, using creation and annihilation operators and we ended up with some solution. And you can check that this state is uh, LME with respect to the traps, which it should be from this easy thing we already said. Also existence of such a state, maybe not this state by any state with diagonal SU3 symmetry as this one is predicted by corollary since SU3 has an elet in dimension six. So we know, so since SU3 has an elet in dimension six, there needs to be some LME state with diagonal SU3 symmetry. The, we do not know how it looks like un, un, uh, unless we solve these equations, but we know it exists. Also, and also we can generalize it to, to more traps, more bosons, not more modes, but uh, um, the same uh, number so of Oscar, traps and I, modes. I sort of, I got, yeah, like I, I got a bit lost in the last part, like, so because you are describing the situation when you have uh, three traps, so three modes, mm -hmm. and uh, there are two bosons that can occupy it, right? Or did I, did I, did I uh, understand well? There are three or modes more complicated? in each trap, yes. Ah, in each trap, sorry, gotcha, yeah. gotcha, okay. So, and, uh, and on the top of that, and okay, and the traps are, I see, so it's such a scenario. Okay, so, and they are formally distinguishable then. If they yes, are yes, traps. traps are distinguishable. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and, uh, okay, and then, okay, so th this is just an example of an, uh, like, where, like, such a, uh, how to put it, like, every trap uh, is a subsystem let's say cd that you said uh, effectively it's is 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 c6 every trap is effectively sure 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 in this in case the, okay in the Thanks. mode right in the mode basis uh, uh, okay uh, thanks yeah and also maybe briefly another example it's similar but more complicated but more interesting also, also is with fermions so uh, we have also possibly interacting Hamiltonian of n trapped fermions with some internal degrees of freedom, let's say, uh, S internal degrees of freedom. So for example, for electrons, uh, S is two, it will be the spin. And uh, the symmetry, so we assume that this uh, Hamiltonian commutes with the total S charge operator. So something is conserved, so for example, for electrons, it will be the total spin conservation. And so we have a mode space and, and a spin space, and so product anti-symmetrization over n traps, right? Uh, I mean, over n fermions, sorry. And it, it, it decomposes into, it's given, it's result by Kliaczko. In Kliaczko's paper, it's shown that this total space decomposes into sectors of fixed total uh, spin, say, or S charge. And if we super select the value of, of S, we, we assume we super select it. 
So in the spin case, we desire um, some total spin Z conservation. So we will super select the, the sector with particular value of the spin. So in fact, we will get the, 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 the sector will consist of states with, with fixed uh, I, right? We will super select it. And this space, of course, is isomorphic to uh, this H lambda M itself, because it's just the tensor product. It's just all vectors are for H lambda M are just tensored with one fixed vector. And it carries the natural action of SUM, uh, which is just the basis change of modes. Because if I have just M modes, I have uh, SUM acting on modes changing the basis, right? We will have the natural action of the uh, basis change will be carried on this space, the Gouffier representation pi. And um, so, in, so we can say that by considering a system of M the distinguishable traps, where the Hilbert space of every single trap is the, the super selected guy with some super selected SZ, we obtain some abstract physical setting that contains LME states with diagonal SUM symmetry. And this symmetry is given by M fold product of pi, which is just the uh, mode basis change, change of basis change of modes in each trap. So here is an example for, but maybe we will skip it. It's just an example of, uh, for some particular number of traps, etc. Uh, so we can go to the article and, and check it if you are interested, um, because there is also one uh, one thing I wanted to discuss. Um, um, sorry, Oscar, I got a bit confused. So yes, like you have those, uh, let's say, uh, fermions, for example, of uh, like composite internal structure. Mm -hmm. uh, then what's the connection with this problem of LME? So do you like, okay, I, I got lost here. <laughs> I mean, I understand this decomposition. It appeared in some other works at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so do you hunt for some maximal entangled states here also? Or like- uh, I, Yes, um... so uh, maybe it's it's just this, this first bullet. We just wanted okay. to say that if we consider such a physical system and distinguishable traps and yeah. every trap is just this h lambda m so it's yeah. just this uh, super, super the space with super selected i mean this guy which appears in the decomposition in these blocks with fixed total spin but also yeah. we super select sz such that the second part uh, uh, yeah so that is uh, isomorphic to h lambda m itself Okay. Um, so then we obtain uh, some physical setting which contains LME states with diagonal SUM symmetries. So these nice, some nice states. And these, I see. Okay. And these nice states have symmetry given by just M fold tensor product of pi. And pi is just the uh, basis change of modes. Uh, this is this, this action of the basis okay. change of modes. That's, that's it. Um, and the last application is um, in, the, uh, in the about the strictly semi-stable state. So this is something we introduced in our previous in in our previous paper, um, also with um, with um, Martin Heibenstreit and Barbara Kraus, where we studied a link between the symmetries of LME states and SLOCC equivalence classes. Um, so um, we, in, in general, we have, we have this SLOCC classes, so the orbits of action of SLOCC operations, and we, can, we have different kinds of orbits because some, some states, let's say we think of the vector space, not the, not, not the projective, uh, projectivization. So we have some orbits and they can have, for example, non-zero, uh, I mean, the norm of a vector under G is changing because it is just the general linear group. So it can change the norm of the vector contrary to K, local uh, unitary operations, which fix the, the norm. So you can have some states which 
So the norm is changing along the SLCC class. So it can be, the infimum of the norm can be zero or can be separated from zero. So if the, so if the, if the infimum norm is positive, it's called semi-stable. If it's zero, then we say it's null comb. And we do not, here we do not, not interested in the null comb, but just in the semi-stable locus. So guys which have non-zero infimum of the norm, right? And on the other hand, we know that the SOCC class contains a Lemy state because K is a subgroup of G. Uh, SOCC class contains a Lemy state if and only if it is closed as, a, as, a, as an orbit, orbit is closed. Closed orbits are exactly a Lemy states. Um, I mean, they are parameterized by equivalence classes of Lemy states up to the local unitary equivalence, right? Closed orbits are parameters. There may be non Lemy states, but if there are, then yeah, that's it. And also, we have this uh, semi-stable locus. So, strictly semi-stable are guys which are semi-stable, but they are not polystable. Uh, they are not closed. They are they do not go through Lemy. So pictorially, it looks like this: that you have these equivalence classes of Lemy states up to the local unitary operations, and each such a point. So each such a point, you have a closed orbit going through it. And there are also another orbits which are not closed, like this, these sheets of higher dimension, which in the closure all contact and, con and have this closed orbit. And these guys exactly are strictly semi-stable states. And so, <clears throat> so, um, and we showed that such strictly semi-stable states, so states which can only be, so these are the guys which can only be converted to, to critical, to Lemy states only uh, asymptotically, right? Because this is only asymptotically. They exist if and only if this Lemy state, which is here, uh, there is some Lemy state with more symmetries. So then generic number of symmetries in the sense of the stabilizer dimension, which means that, so here if you have the sticky semi-stable states, so which means that the stabilizer of this guy is larger than stabilizer of this guy. In this class, there are no orbits. So uh, because of that, um, if we have, uh, okay, so maybe let, let's, let's move to this lemma. So the, Point is that there exists a non-trivial continuous irreducible representations of SUN on SUD, then HN contains an LME state with diagonal, uh, then HN will contain LME state with diagonal SUN symmetry with respect to this pi N. And moreover, HN will contain strictly semi-stable states that can be asymptotically transformed to psi, which has some interesting symmetries. So you see, it's important because we are saying that, you see, because if there, there are some, these, these continuous, the, we have this continuous uh, irrep, the stabilizer has positive dimension. There, there are some um, LME states with high symmetries. It means that there are some SLOCC guys from, which are strictly semi-stable, which can be asymptotically converted to this state. So, they may not have this symmetry, but they can be asymptotically converted via SLCC to a guy which is highly entangled and has um, and has this rich symmetries. So this is just the the point here. Uh, so uh, Oscar, how do you know if I understand well having this? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. The stuff that you said previously uh, was that like if the stabilizer of a uh, uh, of those uh, LME state uh, is larger than the generic stabilizer, like the dimension of the stabilizer of some LME state is larger than the generic di uh, dimension of generic stabilizer group, 
then those semi-stable uh, semi states exist, right? Strictly semi-stable, yes. Strictly, mm -hmm. strictly semi-stable, sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, so how do you know that if, there if the stabilizer contains, I guess, this, uh, let's say, this, uh, uh, this diagonal group that you are studying, how do you know that the dimension of this group is above the dimension of the generic stabilizer subgroup? Because I guess you are, your 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 is implying this, right? Or is making use of that? I mean, yeah. So the, so the point is that we need to have this continuous ELAP in order to yeah. be sure that the stabilizer has um, dimension at least one larger than the. I mean that the, it differs with the dim then you know yeah. um, that the dimension is different than the generic sure. dimension. So what is the generic dimension of the stabilizer then? It's the smallest one. Smallest sure, sure I know, but what is in those cases? Because you need to compare I roughly speaking, I guess you have to compare the dimension of the image of this uh rep pi, right, uh, roughly speaking, with the, uh, uh, with the smaller, uh, like with this uh, small, with this generic uh, stabilized dimension. Um, okay, so maybe, um... I mean, does it make sense what I'm, I, I guess I'm asking just about the, uh, so, uh, like how, so I understand that you need to you have this generic uh, dimension of stabilizer subgroup mm -hmm. which is the yeah. smallest out of uh, all uh, dimensions of stabilizer subgroups from some general considerations right yes but you are now comparing it with some construction of of some state that has some uh, symmetries right so basically you have to ensure that the dimension of the symmetries exceeds this minimal dimension Right? So you have two ingredients. One comes from your construction, right? And the other comes from just the general scenario when you have those qubits and you have to look for the, like, so I'm asking about the second part. Like, how can you ensure? You know? Yes, so uh, I will need to go to the, because I okay, don't think that... about it in private, but does it make sense? I see. I will tell you. Way. I will tell you because I'll need to discuss the proof. Uh, but uh, okay. uh, maybe I like, will finish, and because I'm, just, I just have the summary and the uh, full comment yeah. thing, and we can discuss it. Mm, right. So, so things which can be improved or studied <clears throat> further. Uh, way way to deal with systems with non-homogeneous local dimensions. Also, we have some conjecture. Also, uh, it appeared um, uh, during our work on the previous um, previous uh, article that if the manifold of LME states in a multi qubit system up to local unitary equivalence has dimension at least one, then uh, uh, this system contains strictly semi-stable states. So that's, that's some conjecture. Also, obviously, better ways of finding explicit forms of LME states of diagonal asymmetry, because I already said that this algorithm is exponential, uh, is, is, has a bad scaling. And perhaps concrete forms of Krauss operators realizing set for states with diagonal asymmetry. So if we know that the state has the you know, G symmetry, A symmetry, uh, yeah, mm, then what will be the forms of the Krauss operators realizing the realizing steps? So the summary is that um, highly entangled states <coughs> with large local unitary symmetries are important. LME states with diagonal H symmetries are examples of such states. Um, such states can be realized in a quantum system of distinguishable crabs with bosons or fermions with occupying finite a number of modes. They can be found numerically. There is this theorem, the main theorem, which tells, tells you for what powers the rep space uh, contains 
a limit state diagonal SUM symmetry given by pi. And the results, these results can be linked with the existence of so-called strictly semi-stable states with particular asymptotic diagonal symmetries uh, in the sense that they can be asymptotically transformed to a state with particular uh, large diagonal symmetry. And uh, that's it. So uh, thank you very much. And maybe there are some questions. Yes, Man, thank, uh, thanks Oscar for interesting talk. Uh, yeah, we have time for questions and comments. Uh, hopefully not from me. Oscar, I have one question. Yes. When you are presenting your uh, results uh, in this table, you had uh, uh, with this uh, italics zeros. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Did you check it anyway if you will receive zeros or, or did you just prove the lemma and, uh, and went with it? Like, like did you do, try to calculate it anyway? Despite the, the, the proof of the lemma, I, I assume you would get zeros anyway, but uh, just wondering if you, if you did the computation. Oh, I think I think uh, uh, it was just some time ago, but I think we didn't run this calculation. I see. I see. Okay, thanks. Uh, but no, no, no. I think we run it to to check if this theorem holds, if this lemma holds, because lemma predicts there should be zeros, and I think we checked uh, if it's really zero and it it was zero. So I guess we did both and and compared. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions to Oscar? Okay, if not, let us conclude our meeting. Yes, yeah, so just uh, a note for everybody. So the like next week we will have seminars on seminar on Wednesday, the same time. We are shifting to to Wednesdays. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks uh, to Oscar especially for agreeing to, to to give this talk and for giving it. Yeah. Uh, cheers.